Welcome to the Diversity and Inclusion On Air podcast. This podcast is a program of the Association of American Veterinary Medical College's Diversity Matters Initiative. The podcast explores various issues related to diversity and inclusion in the veterinary profession and provides the AAVMC an opportunity to offer ongoing diversity programming to its member institutions as well as all veterinary professionals. My name is Lisa Greenhill and I'm the Senior Director for Institutional Research and Diversity at the AAVMC. So today is our um, first episode of our third season. I am so excited. Today we are going to talk about a very important topic with our guests. Uh, We're going to talk about microaggressions. What are they? Um, Why do we do them? How do we react to them? What's their cumulative effect? All of that good stuff. And I am delighted to welcome our guest. Dr. Kathy Wong Lao. Um, she is the Chief Diversity Officer at San Jose. San Jose State University. State University. And um, well, I'm just really, really excited. I um, have been a huge fan of hers for a number of years. I'm a bit of a, a um, communications groupie for her, and I am so excited that she's on the show. So well, welcome. Thank you. thank you, Lisa. I'm really proud to be on the show and happy to be here. And And I'll just follow up and segue into a little bit about my background. So I am somebody who has a a PhD in intercultural communication, and my areas of research and study are on um, organizational communication and diversity and inclusion. Um, And in particular, looking at some of the emotional labor that we all do in our jobs um, that can fall differently in terms of responsibilities for different folks. Sometimes it plays out differently, as well as, um, you know, what is some of the the great research behind um, intergroup dialogues and intercultural communication that helps us reduce bias as we are communicating. So so those are sort of my areas. Um, I just got here to San Jose State about a year ago, um, returning back to the Bay Area. So I grew up in um, Oakland and Hayward area here in the Bay Area, went off to, um, as an older returning student, um, got my bachelor's degree, and then went on to Arizona State University to get my PhD. So um, I was previously, um, prior to this, I was at University of Oklahoma. I was the director of NCOR, the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity. Um, And then I was also at Western Michigan University where I fell into work uh, working with vet schools at Michigan State University. Um, That's how I met Lisa and other colleagues at uh, Purdue and and other universities. Um, I've attended one of the national um, AABM MC uh, conferences and um, have spent time working with deans and associate deans of colleges of veterinary med um, to help them, you know, develop either diversity initiatives or training for faculty or work with them on their strategic planning. So it's something that is near and dear to my heart in terms of the profession. Um, and it's been interesting to see the changes, I think, in the last 10 or 15 years. And so that's yes. a background on me. So, yeah. Awesome. So and then I have to ask, are there any pets that we need to talk about? <laughs> yes, I'm actually um, one of those people. And I'm sure there are many people here in the audience, but I've got four adopted dogs. So um, all, right. all rescues, um, 90 pound lab husky, 60 pound border collie, something, something or other. Um, and then uh, uh, a Pomeranian Chihuahua, who's nine pounds, and then a, a Yorkie Schnauzer, who's the big boss, and he's only 20 pounds. But anyways. Oh, well, you got the whole gamut there. there. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much again for joining us. Um, so yeah, as Kathy has is very much in touch and in tune with what's going on in veterinary medicine and has worked with so many of our colleagues. So we're really glad that she's here. So let's just dive right in. What are microaggressions? We know that like a lot of people think that it's a big buzzword. Um, and you've got the kind of um, when you break down the two parts of the word, you've got very something aggressive, but then it's really small. So what are microaggressions? Yeah. So, so I think I'm going to start talking by saying what it's not. So um, so the term, the, the sort of the concomitant term you probably haven't heard before is, or some people haven't, is the word macroaggression, right? So macroaggressions are those very clear, like someone's shouting a racial slur, someone makes a misogynistic comment, you know, that's, um, you know, advocating sexual assault, for example. Those are macroaggressions. And I think that, you know, it's more the bullying type behavior. So 
We know that when we're in institutions, we often get training, anti-bullying training, like in the public schools, but even in the workplace. And macroaggress macroaggressions are a little bit more clear, right? You've got to make a decision. Are you going to engage? You've got to make sure there's safety. There's, there's processes generally within um, HR and other things to deal with these things. The harder things to deal with are what we call microaggressions. So in macroaggressions, it's, it's, although it's horrible to receive and be the target of a macroaggression, it's very clear when you decide to fight back or file a grievance. It's, it's pretty, you know, most of the time people are gonna agree, they're gonna interview you and they're gonna say, oh my God, that was horrible. With, with microaggressions, why they are important to look at is that they are difficult to deal with because they are so micro, right? Yet we know from research that microaggressions have take a huge psychological toll and contribute a lot to organizational culture. So, um, and, and perceptions of safety or welcomeness or warmness or coolness of, of, of the climate or like a chilly climate, that term chilly mm -hmm. climate actually comes from understanding how microaggressions contribute to that. So, the, so they're micro meaning that they are often, um, they're micro in two ways. One, they're not very severe, generally. Um, they're generally made in everyday comments. And then secondarily, it, it rides that line where you're kind of going, what, did this person really intend this? Or it seems like they don't understand. And so a lot of times we let them go. The problem is, in any organization, some people are subject to just the sheer number is much higher for certain people. And so for them, they can feel not included or not like a legitimate member of an organization or a unit just by the sheer number that constantly occurs. And so because they're micro, we generally don't talk to people about them. So then you have this other whammy where people who um, may witness them or might be perpetrating them have no idea that they've done something wrong. Because if you're going to say something, you feel like, oh, I'm making a big you know, mountain out of molehill or I'm, I'm, I'm being overly sensitive. And so you don't end up saying anything. You just keep it in your head. And then they just continue, right? So, so it's not a good, if we don't deal with them, it's also not a good learning environment or there's not a lot of opportunity for that unit to improve, right, to learn. So, so in terms of aggression, I think sometimes that word is a is is problematic. Um, they're they're more like um, you know they're more like micro statements of exclusion, right? So they're more like micro exclusions. They really aren't most of the time aggressive, right? Yeah. So I think that that vocabulary is problematic because I think it helps people misunderstand it. So I know that from my experience of working with um, vet med and also my conversations with you, an example of a microaggression might be for, for, uh, for someone who's in vet med might be, oh, you know, um, so, so do you guys get to really do any real doctoring or is that, do you really study medicine or right. do you write prescriptions? Are you a real doctor? So, so the, it doesn't seem aggressive to, people who are not in vet med, for many people, it might be, oh, they're just asking a curious question, right? But mm -hmm. for, and so when someone goes off and says, you know, oh my God, I'm so tired of this, or they shut their door, their exam door, their office door, and kind of go, oh my God, I can't believe this. This happens all the time. It can sometimes, a very small thing can be the straw that breaks the camel's back because you're the target of those all the time, right? Now, why are they exclusionary? They make it, you know, within the hierarchy of, of health sciences, it makes it seem like, vet med is not included, first of all, in health sciences. Part of that is just the sheer number of vet med programs. So if we look at, you know, um, how many medical schools there are versus how many vet schools there are, um, you know, if people don't understand what land grant institutions are, that whole thing, they don't picture vet med as being a health science, right? right. But nonetheless, people get very similar training and, and the rigor and the difficulty of getting into the programs and getting certified and, and, and all those things are just as strenuous and, and the help that, that people provide and care is, is just as incredibly important to society in general. Right. Um, you know, and I know that, you know, people probably go into talking about zoonotic diseases and indicators of, you know, health and human health and all those things that are related to vet med, but the average person is not going to think of all those things. Right. No. And so it no. feels like a microaggression because because if you go off on somebody, they're gonna be like, oh my God, all I was doing was asking, are you like real doctors? Why did you get so <laughs> right? Right. Right. And so that's that's the part that creates cognitive dissonance for people. It's that decision point. You know, I'm not a wimp, right? So we're in very competitive types of, of disciplines, right? For me, getting into a PhD program was really hard. So we know that we're very strong people. 
and that we have made it so far, we're intellectually smart, and so why can't we just sort of let it go and just be, you know, be this warrior and just move through, right? Um, that's the part that's crazy making. That's what makes it really hard and wears on it. So, so that's, I think, the hard part about microaggressions. They're very hard to address without people feeling defensive, feeling angry, and then it, it's really um, exhausting for people to continually educate people about them. So I'll give you a very long answer, but I'm hoping it's helpful in terms of understanding. I think I might have lost you. Hello? Hello. So Lisa, I think I've lost you. Hello? Um, let's see. Hello? Hello, Lisa? Okay. Hello? <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> Hi, I'm not sure what happened there. <laughs> <laughs> we were on such a roll and it just kind of overheated, I think. So <laughs> so what I was about to say before technology failed me was um, that it sounds a bit like um, I've likened microaggressions to uh, various kinds of paper cuts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you get a paper cut and you're like, ah, you know, that, oh, that really hurts. Um, but, you know, there's different kinds of paper cuts. You can get the one that's on the side of the finger, the one that's on the knuckle that really, really kind of stings. Um, and then, you know, the, the most awful of all paper cuts, the cardboard paper cut, which really, <laughs> you know, hurts. But, like, really, who do you complain to? Right. Right? <laughs> right, right. So, so, so. Um, what are some examples of, pa of, of paper cuts, of, of microaggressions um, that are pretty common? Um, I mean, certainly, uh, you know, we know that they exist across pretty much every dimension. But mm -hmm. some of, what are some of the ones that I think that, that you may have heard um, most frequently kind of complained about? Yeah, so, um, so in my training here that I've done with, um, so I just finished training, I think, we went through, we rolled through 8,600 frosh and transfer students at face-to-face -face training um, to our diversity training on this campus. And so part of the reason why I'm telling you this is we put together some videos on um, stereotyping and microaggressions based on research on focus groups, student focus groups and experiences that students have had. One of the most common ones across the country at University of Oklahoma, as well as here and other places is 
um, the often seemingly innocent question of where are you from, right? So, so this is what happens. So then this happens to me also, right? Someone will say, where are you from? Um, and I'll say, oh, I'm from, I'm from California, but I was most recently from Oklahoma. And they'd say, no, no, where are you really from? And I'm like, I'm, I'm really from here, right? I mean, I am, I'm living here. And what they're trying to find out is what my race or ethnicity is, right? And, and a lot of times as I'm busy and someone asks me, I just kind of say, oh yeah, yeah, I was born here and, da, 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 and I'm kind of moving on and, and I'm trying to like either, I'm in a meeting and I'm doing something and, and I'm saying something and it's clear to me that person hasn't heard me because they're focused on trying to figure out where I'm from. Right, so I might say something, and here I'm Kathy Wong. Da, 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 I was coming to this meeting today to work on this. I was, and they'll say, "Where are you from?" And I'm like, you know, sort of obviously they didn't hear the first thirty seconds of whatever I said, right? Because they're focusing on where I'm from. Now, it's not usually poorly intended, right? But when this happens on a regular basis, you feel like, you know, for many Asian Americans, for example, and many Latinos, it feels like, you know, you're forever foreign. Right? People mm. always assume that you're from somebody else. Um, I speak English fairly well, I think. Um, I, I did grow up bilingually. I learned English in kindergarten. Um, but I have had people tell me that they think I have um, an Asian accent, right? Or, or that I'm hard to understand. I've actually had people tell me that. Um, and, and I think it's because of the way that they see me, right? And so the, or they'll say something like, oh, you speak English so good, right? Um, and, and, you know, and I'll be like, well, actually, I speak it very well. Thank you. But, but, but. <laughs> But I'll say, well, I was born here, right? Um, and although I grew up bilingually, I do speak English. Now, now I know for me, I'm, I'm older now. And so it's not something that, that it does bother me, but it doesn't make me not function well anymore because I'm, I'm in my mid fifties, I'm 56, I'm heading towards 57. But when I think back to, um, I just did this training where we, we showed this, where are you from skit? And there were many young students who were 18, 19, 20 years old who said that, you know, this happens to me 10 times a week. And I often wonder, do people see anything else about me? It's hard to get over it to sort of say, okay. And it's exhausting to educate 10 different people in 10 different settings, right? Sure. Um, so, so I think that's, you know, that's an example of a microaggression that seems fairly innocuous, right? People just asking you where you're from, um, but they're actually trying to figure out, are you an immigrant? Are you American? Are you, you know, they're questioning your citizenship, those kind of things. Right? Sure. So, yeah, that's one example. Yeah. Okay. So, so we hear it, there comes a decision point, then what? <laughs> then what right? <laughs> yeah. So, so I want to say that most of the time when microaggressions occur, the person who's targeted generally does not feel motivated to say anything. And so what happens is you have this very polite conversation where this person goes, oh, okay, well, yeah, I'm from California. Well, you know, my parents are from China and Hong Kong. And then you just politely sort of disengage. And, and the, the problem is, is that even at my level of annoyance, I may not even consciously tell myself that this is bias. I'll just feel uncomfortable. And that means though, that I'm probably never gonna to come to this person with a difficult issue. I'm probably gonna do a lot of identity protection, right? So I'm not, if I'm, if I'm struggling, if I need help, if that person's my supervisor, I probably won't go to that person, right? And so, so it has long-term impacts that are not intentional. And, and the sad thing is, I'm probably never gonna tell this person unless I get to the point where I see them do it to somebody else and I think to myself, oh gosh, I should probably say something because that happened to me, right? And that does happen too, right? Sure. Um, so, so what you can say and what I have said, I, I have said through most of my career, I will actually pick a time to talk to that person and I will say, hey, I just want to talk to you the other day. I know you don't know me that well, but I know that you know you want to do good work and I know that you're part of this organization, you want to be a good leader. I'm going to share you, with you something that I saw you ask somebody else or that you ask me this, right? And this is why it can be detrimental. That person is never going to tell you. They may not even be able to articulate why they were bothered, but I could tell by the look on their face, they were a little bit taken aback. And so what happens is if you want to be a good facilitative leader, then that person may not ever come back to you or see you as a leader, even, you know, not at a conscious level, but at an unconscious level, they're just not going to have that trust with you. Now, it is very hard for people to receive those kind of messages, right? And so I tell them that this is a gift from me. It's a gift of a, of a perspective that you may not ever get to hear because most people don't want to make a mountain out of a molehill. But research shows that when we continually receive microaggressions in an organization, 
they can feel just as exclusionary as a macroaggression. And in fact, they're harder to deal with because there is no socially acceptable way to deal with it. When someone calls you a slur, it's very socially acceptable to, to fight back and say something. When it's something that's subtle, it makes it really hard, right? And so then these things don't change, they get passed on. And then to boot, people don't realize because no one's told them, right, that there's a problem with it. Right, right. So, so um, um, are, are, are folks that, 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 that commit microaggressions malicious? 99% of the time, no. There certainly are people that do it maliciously. Most of it is unconscious. Most of it is, it, it's not necessarily lack of exposure. So that's another misnomer. Just because you've been, so I'm here at San Jose State University, very diverse campus. Just because you've been on in diverse interactions doesn't mean that someone has spoken to you and said, hey, you know what, what you said was kind of a problem. We will generally, um, you know, suck it up and, and sort of say, okay, so I'll interact with this person. This person's a good person. And so you're, you know, and you might be a strong person, so you let it pass, right? That's the thing that we do, we let it pass. And so then the next person they encounter who might be in a more fragile condition or might be new, brand new to the organization or might be the token, the only person of that identity in the organization is going to have less ability to, and less allies to understand and be able to address that issue. So, so I think that, you know, it's really easy to sort of, again, write them off and say that they're not important, but they, but they are important, especially when people are the continual targets. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I, I really liked um, how you laid out, this is, this is um, uh, a way to confront um, someone who may have said something inappropriate. Um, but is that realistic? I mean, we've, we're talking about this kind of like the ways that people go, I really don't want to deal with this. But is that realistic for a student or a new grad um, or an employee? I think that this messaging around um, this type of behavior may be preventing you from becoming a better leader is incredibly helpful. Um, but I'm kind of wondering for those first year students at you know, College of Veterinary Medicine X, are they really going to say <laughs> anything? <laughs> no, I think the responsibility actually comes from administration um, as well as faculty um, and, and those more senior students. Um, and, and I know that there are different challenges in vet med because you've got folks who are clinical folks, you have folks who are strictly in the classroom, um, you've got folks who sort of straddle both worlds. And so, it's important for administration to provide the curriculum so that it is normative to talk about these things, right? So that the responsibility does not fall upon students. Um, it is not the responsibility of students to educate somebody with the risk that that person may come back and think, oh, this person is politically correct and they're overly sensitive, right? Um, and this person is a, a troublemaker. Um, I, I don't often think that most people think that at the conscious level. I think that bias occurs, a lot of bias occurs at the unconscious level. And so they might just feel an overall discomfort or fear or like they have to step on eggs around, eggshells around this person because they're worried that person's gonna bite their head off, right? So, um, so, it, so it has to come from the leadership. Um, at the same time, I think that um, there needs to be regularized opportunities to talk about these things, not in a, a theoretical sense, but really in the sense of the level of the unit, right? So um, you can talk about both the theoretical level and what, what is happening nationally that is occurrence and then triangulate with what's going on with us, right? Um, because a lot of these things are not, it's not rocket science, it's not new, it's been going on for a long time, um, but we, we don't legitimize it and we don't make it so that people can talk about it. It's never gonna be comfortable talking about these things, um, but it never should be the people who are targets, the ones who take the responsibility to educate. So, so I educate people about microaggressions that have nothing to do with Asian Americans or women, because I feel like that as a leader, that's my job. Right. I think that faculty and administrators and clinicians need to take that on with their students. We've got to role model the type of behavior that we would want people to have and, and to, to have the courage to have these hard conversations, you know, and I think it's really hard. 
you can get a lot of training through intergroup dialogue type curriculum that can be run and um, in units across the country. Certainly, there are plenty of people doing intergroup dialogues. It comes out of University of Michigan originally, but it's all over all over the, the country. Um, and again, providing people with the tools to have the difficult conversations, um, not in a way that's comfortable, but in a way that's productive, right? So conflict needs to be a part of it, as hard as conflict is. Yeah. Right. So um, before, I want to, before I move on to how do we get to, how do we as individuals kind of stop ourselves in our tracks from committing this, I want to talk about, you mentioned at the top of the show um, a, a term I, I only heard a couple of times before, um, emotional labor. Yeah. Um, and, and I just thought that that was really interesting. So could you tell us a little bit about that term? And I'm assuming that, um, in relation to this particular topic, that cumulative effect is going to increase emotional labor. Does that impact productivity? Yes, it sure does. So emotional labor was a concept that was, uh, I would say, formed by um, Arlie Hochschild, um, who was a sociologist at UC Berkeley. And she originally um, looked at the the labor or the work that it took for two categories of employees to produce labor for the good of the work or was commodified for the work. So it's called, um, I think it's like emotional labor, um, the work of the heart or something. I can't remember what, what the exact subtitle was. But um, so she looked at flight attendants and she looked at bill collectors, right? So with flight attendants, of course, we all know they're in customer service and so they have to produce a certain type of positive customer service, caretaking behavior, regardless of the treatment that they receive from the passenger, right, the paying customer. So someone could be a total jerk, um, you know, harass the flight attendant, I mean, do all kinds of things, ring the bell constantly, yell at people. They, they have to produce a certain type of surface emotion that may not match their internal emotion, right? And they're doing it because that's part of the work, right? So it's labor. The other case is um, a bill collector. So bill collectors, um, she, she did focus groups and interviewed a whole bunch of people in both professions. Bill collectors have to produce this negative, threatening, sort of bullying persona um, to, to sort of scare people into paying bills that, you know, something's going to happen to them, they're going to lose everything, even though legally that may not be so, right? And so then some of the research she did, she, she has bill collectors who are who are being really nasty and mean to like a grandmother or an elderly woman who could be their own mother. And so they're having to produce this negative emotions for the good of the work, right? So in both cases, people are producing emotions that are not in line with how they're feeling. And Arlene Hothschild and many other researchers now have looked at this, um, looked at sort of the cost, the personal cost in terms of um, mental health, job satisfaction, um, you know, longevity in that job, turnover rate, as well as um, mental health issues and, and the ability to think clearly, right? So when we have to continually produce labor that emotional labor or emotions that surface emotions that don't match what we're feeling inside, it has a huge cost in terms of that person feeling legitimate, feeling like they belong in the organization, feeling affirmed and valued and, and just general overall health and, and productivity. Right, so you get the the surly flight attendant who just had the last straw and goes off on somebody, <laughs> or the bill collector who can only do the job for so many years and then just goes out because they, you know, they end up feeling really horrible about what they're doing. Right. Sure. By the same token, um, there's been a lot of research done on the emotional labor of people who are in in a minority context um, or are tokenized in organizations, particularly in higher education, but also um, like gender and women in law firms. Uh, so there's been a lot done. My own dissertation was on the emotional labor of women of color um, in uh, women of color faculty in um, diversity work on campuses, right? So, so there's a so so. Let's say you experience a microaggression. Your first instinct is going to go, "Oh my God, that felt horrible." But you're because you're with your colleagues. You watch your face. You fix your face, and you do this. Okay, all right. We're going to let that go. Keep moving for the good of the work. This meeting is only an hour long. I'm not going to take up this time to talk about this. And so that is also emotional labor. In fact, people report often having to have this public face, and then when they close their office door, it's a whole different thing, right? or putting on this, this projection of who you are the minute you leave your house in the morning or the minute you arrive in the garage on campus, you become this different person. Now, all people do emotional labor to a certain extent. 
So it's not, it's nothing that it's only happening with people who are in the minority position. But for people in the minority position, when issues of race or gender or discrimination of some sort comes up, people who are in the targeted position often have to produce a lot of emotional labor to watch everything that they're saying so that they can not have people overly stereotype them, for example, about being an angry woman of color or stereotype them about being an immigrant or all these sorts of things. White people um, and middle class people also produce a certain amount of emotional labor. So, so there's been more and more research on um, aversive racism, right? So aversive racism is when people, um, and there's also aversive heterosexism and aversive sexism. It's when people who are in the majority are producing, are, are really anxious and producing a lot of emotional labor because they don't want to be seen as racist or they don't want to be seen as, um, you know, as sexist or homophobic, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And so what happens is then everybody tries to take care of that person because they're so stressed out about people thinking they're discriminatory, right? And so the focus becomes uh, them rather than the incident that they're talking about. So people spend time posturing to make sure that they're seen as, as being inclusive and inclusive leader and all those things. So, so it gets really complicated, right? When we're talking about being allies or doing work together, it's important that people can, that we have leaders who can talk about these issues up front so that you can work all those things out as you're going through um, a process of trying to solve a problem or address an issue. I think it's really it's important, really important that, that you brought, brought up, up this, this um, uh, idea of idea averse, aversive, <laughs> aversive, aversive uh, yeah. emotional yeah. labor. I think that um, mm -hmm. I think that that for folks that are kind of doing diversity work, sometimes we forget <laughs> that folks are working really, really, really hard. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and people, people are scared. Are to, right? People are scared. People are scared to say the wrong thing. People don't, you know, they don't want to be the next viral video. They don't want to be the right. next viral tweet. You know, tweeting is a whole other thing, but we'll do that's another thing. Right, right? that's a different show. Yeah. Right, that's a different show. But, but you know, people people are, are concerned that they might say the wrong thing that's read in a way that, that impugns their entire organization or them or their whole profession. Right, right. Yeah. So um, other than taking, you know, 30 seconds before we open our mouths every single, <laughs> For every single sentence, how yeah. do we not do this? How do we yeah. how do we prevent microaggressions? So the best way to do it, um, in terms of really overall um, overriding a lot of our bias, right? So so bias happens in our working memory, and our working memory. So it's in the unconscious part. Our working memory is part of our is the part of our brain that aggregates and synthesizes all of our new information that we take in. It sorts it, it compares it to old information, it might sort of add it to a connection to something that was similar, or you kind of learn something, oh my God, that what I always knew was wrong, and you might incorporate that in, right? But it happens at the unconscious level. It's that part of your brain when you're trying to remember the name of a pop star and you can't remember it for the life of you, and you know everything, the, you know, the the music, you know, you know the song, you know what they look like, and you can even like cite some lines from their movie. And for some reason, if they asked you 20 minutes ago, you would know that person's name, but for some reason it just escapes you. You know it's there, it's gone, right? And you don't have time to look it up on a phone, you get distracted, and then like an hour later, you're walking your dog, and then boom, that name pops in, right? right? That's your working memory. And unfortunately, that's where your bias mechanisms, that categorical, sloppy categorical thinking occurs. So it's not anything we can control. You can try really hard to sort of, you know, tell yourself, I'm not going to be racist. I'm not going to be sexist. Generally, what we're telling ourselves to do is to not interact. And that's not a good thing, right? So that's usually how we interpret telling ourselves not to be sexist or not to be racist or not to be discriminatory. We choose to sort of withdraw and not interact. And, that, and research shows that. That's our, you know, we, we tell ourselves that, but that's what we end up doing. That's not necessarily a good thing. We want to engage. Um, so the research shows the best way to, to bypass those bias pathways is through structured interaction where we perspective take consistently from people that we don't know and that are different than we are. What does that mean? Doing a lot of research, looking at YouTube videos online about people's lives, so, you know, engaging in dialogue with people, asking good questions. Um, you know, in my work um, here, for example, I often have to talk to people, um, you know, like since the election, talk to people who are worried about their, their students being Republicans, for example, on a very diverse campus and about their safety. Um, some of the statements that people make are, you know, I, I have to sort of go, whoa, I, you know, 
are you sure that's, you know, I don't, I don't say that, but I'm thinking to myself, okay, let me get this straight. And so I ask questions and I write things down and I say, so when, when you say this, what, what exactly happened? And sometimes it's really their hopes or their fears and it's not something that's happened. Sometimes something has happened, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, I'm, even though I, I can't identify with, relate to, or even come up with, dream up what people might be thinking, it's important for me to write those things down and commit to understand why this parent or why the student is feeling the way that they're feeling. Because that helps me so that the next time I encounter um, a parent or a student, I'm wondering what their story is. I'm not making assumptions about who they are, or how they grew up, or what area they came from here in California or from somewhere else, right? And so, so how we bypass bias is by accumulating perspectives, what we call cognitive empathy, perspective taking, as frequently as we can in our everyday lives. If we do that consistently, then we reduce the chance of those bias pathways from happening. And that's really how we do it. And that's what the research shows is actually highly effective, which is why intergroup dialogues are highly effective, which is why, you know, um, the most effective way is face-to-face -face interaction versus reading, but, but cognitive empathy is one of the reasons why um, school children are required to read Anne Frank in many schools, right? So it's not just, oh, Jews have rights and, you know, and, and Jews should, um, you know, not be subject to anti-Semitism. We can say all those things, but there is nothing more um, powerful than actually reading someone's story and understanding why they think and feel the way they do, right? So, so that's sort of the crux of it. It's cognitive empathy. It's not actually emotional empathy. It's actually cognitive empathy. Mm. Mm. So when we engage in emotional empathy too much, we actually, our cognition shuts off, right? <laughs> So a lot of the stuff that you may be hearing in the news, what happened in Charlottesville and all those things, they make people really upset. And so people go out and march. So I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but I'm saying that usually that's not the moment where we're going to reduce our bias in very complex cognitive ways. We're, we're, we're in the moment and we're, and we're very emotional. And, and I'm saying that that's positive. It's important to be an ally and do all those things, but that's only the beginning. We actually need to take the time to study about, you know, how do Confederate statues come about, study about different groups, study about how different people are experiencing these things so that we can actually reduce those bias pathways, right? And the emotions will come along, but now it's gonna be attached to data. Gotcha. So that makes us better critical thinkers, right? In complex social relations. So, so just to be clear. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> The cognitive and the emotional don't always work together. <laughs> they don't always work well together if if the emotional empathy is is um, not too high. It, it is overwhelming. Gotcha. Is it over? Okay. Yeah. So it can be, you know, but but emotions are running high. It's really right, hard. But, but coming to out, kind of but emotions that. can serve as a prime prime mover, prime motivator. Right. So so I'm not saying that we shouldn't have emotions. I don't want I want to clarify that. Right. So so let's say I as an Asian American, um, let's say I wasn't doing this diversity. Let's say I, I, I don't understand how African-Americans are experiencing policing, for example. Right. And then let's say I see a video. I, I go to a demonstration and I'm and I'm just, you know, I mean, I'm just heartbroken. I'm grief stricken. How can this be happening in our country? So it's let's say it's new for me. Right. Um, it's important for me to, to stay in that moment, right? Because that might actually move me to change my behavior and, and my, my goals of learning more, right? But if I stay there and I, then I start reading and doing things, it's not gonna help me in terms of my ability to think in very critical ways, right? So I, I have to really sort of develop a program of study for myself and you know, figure out how am I gonna get access to these perspectives without, making people have to relive their, their um, experience of discrimination to, to educate me, but I might go online, I might um, you know, go to Facebook pages or Instagram feeds where I can learn more about this, for example, right? Mm -hmm. And then interact with people that, you know, that, that might be comfortable and willing to, to educate me, right? And do the reading, take a class, do whatever it is. So, so if I do that, then my learning is gonna be sustained and actually my bias pathways will actually, they, they will change. Right. Whereas if I stay in just the emotional, I just have a deep abiding ability to protest and be angry, but I have no content that's actually going to change the way that I think, except for extreme pain or grief or empathy 
at the emotional level, but, but there's nothing that can help me learn how to interact and move and become a real ally. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And the learning part is the hard part. It is. Yeah. So, um, so we're going to get ready to start wrapping up, but I have a couple more questions. So one question that I have is, um, say I have committed a microaggression, like, and I, I literally hear it coming out of my mouth. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and it comes out. And it comes out. And I mean, okay. and, and it's funny because you, you mentioned the, the where are you from one. Um, I think for a lot of African-Americans, particularly for those of us who are from the Southeast, we um, will ask other African-Americans from other parts of the country, like, oh, OK, well, but where are you from? Yeah, right. like right. black people are not from the Bay Area. Like, <laughs> we're not from there. <laughs> Where's your grandmother from? <laughs> right, 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 right. What state, what state, what state yeah. did you migrate? What, during the Great Migration, yeah. where you from? And it is, um, you know, to get some piece of information um, about genealogy, right? And so, um, and Native Americans, for example, the question of where are you from is a very powerful question. It's about your connection to the land and what you know, where your ancestors are from, all that stuff. So, absolutely. So there are all of these different pieces, yeah. but um, you know, I was at Encore um, a few months ago, the beginning of the summer, sitting with a colleague, and I said something, and I mean, as soon as it slid out of my mouth, I was like, "Oh my!" Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, and I said, "You know, that's not how I really meant for that to come out." Let me try to take a moment to say what I really meant, mm -hmm. because that seemed like a shortcut. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, is that okay? <laughs> so is is um, is that one strategy that we can do when we recognize that we're about to say something that might be hurtful? Um, Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. Can we just take a moment. And this reminds me of some research that's really important. So for faculty, clinicians, administrators, and people who are in leadership positions, right? Letting a comment pass, whether it's one that came out of your mouth or somebody else's mouth can have very long lasting impacts on not only on the person who may be perceived as a target of some of these comments, but um, it actually sends a message to everybody else that you're not someone who can handle, be a safe person to handle something. So let, let's, let's say you're in a context and someone makes a comment about immigrants, right? It's not horrible, it's not like immigrants should die or something, but it's a comment about immigrants, right? Oh, I think that immigrants are taking jobs away from other people. Let's say someone says that, right? Or, um, you know, should we be giving um, uh, valuable slots to people from other countries because they don't speak English well anyway? So let's say someone says that, right? So, so the faculty member kind of says, you know, like, oh my gosh, and everybody freezes and everybody turns and looks at the faculty member or people look uncomfortable, look at their shoes or whatever it is, right? Research shows that if that faculty member says nothing and pretends like, you know, I'm just going to move on, or they kind of go, okay, and they just kind of move on, right? They sort of give a little bit of an indication that it's awkward, but they move on, but they don't address it directly. Research shows that in that room, um, people who are marginalized by other identities, so people who are LGBTQ, people who are poor, people who are first-gen students, people who are people of color, will not see that instructor as a safe person because that person could not handle something as, as that. Right now, they're not doing it consciously, but in their subconscious, they do not see that person as someone who can handle diversity issues. So if there are things like Title IX issues that happen, if there's harassment that happens, like in work groups or in the, you know, out in the um, clinical areas or out when they're out in practice as interns or something, they are not likely to see that person as someone who can handle what's going on. And so they may either put up with it or they'll go find somebody else. Right. Now the research, the good thing is the research also shows that you can go back and make repair. Mm -hmm. so, so let's say you let it pass and the next class you're like, oh my God, I should have said something. You're heading into the next class. What you can do, it only takes like two or three minutes. It doesn't take a lot. You don't have to like cry and wring your hands or anything. All you have to say is, you know, in the last class, someone made this comment. It sounds like, you know, maybe it wasn't intentional, but it could be perceived as being, you know, very anti-immigrant. I just want to say that probably wasn't intentional, but I just want to take care of it and address it. That's all you have to say. Easy it's not easy. very easy. And students will see you as somebody who can take care of them and you will be someone who has earned the respect so that when that student runs into other types of problems or other students run into problems, they will be able to come to you. Now that's, that's really important. Sometimes, you know, we, 
you know, there, there's research that very, you have to just change up a few things. Sure, it's scary to talk about, but you can be as disfluent um, as you can be, and it can be as awkward, it can be even a class later, and research shows that you have repaired that relationship and that respect with those students. And that's why it's important to learn to communicate about these issues. Right. Yeah. Awesome. So my last uh, question for our show um, is, what advice would you give um, to our member institutions as well as all veterinary professionals and just that that baseline kind of go forth and do good work <laughs> with respect to microaggressions? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that, you know, I think that people need to understand that most things are well-intended, um, but at the same time, these well-intended remarks have real material harms, right? So, so they can be tracked to things like, um, you know, a high turnover rate, uh, retention, time to graduation. I mean, all kinds of things that are really problematic. So, so it's hard to talk about the issues, and it's hard to risk, um, you know, having people evaluate you for awkwardly talking about a topic that nobody wants to talk about, right? But the but the payoffs are are tremendous, right? In terms of developing a climate where people feel comfortable making mistakes. I think that's the thing that I would say that the culture that's really important that we, that we try to set is that you need to feel comfortable making mistakes. Um, you know, and so the example I gave of a, of a professor coming back the next class and saying, you know, I screwed up. I wish I had said something. These things are hard to talk about, but here I want to talk about it. That's role modeling to students that it's, it's okay to make mistakes as long as we take responsibility and we engage, right? And so we're never gonna know enough about every single identity group out there. And everybody commits microaggressions at some point. I do sometimes, I have a couple of times where I've just been like, oh my God, you know, and I immediately say something, right? Or I, I, I mistakenly identify um, something that is current and for some group it's like, no, that's actually not how people feel um, on this campus, right? So coming back to California, Things are very different than in the context of Michigan, Oklahoma, these places I've worked in for the last 20 years, right? So, so, so again, it's important to role model that the only way we're going to get move forward is that, that we are willing to make mistakes. That's that's great advice. Yeah. That's great advice. Yeah. Great life advice, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and take care of each other, right? If you can take care of each other, um, you know, for those who have more power and more privilege. Do that caretaking when people are making mistakes and they're struggling and they're trying to move forward you know sort of like how can i help you right yeah. uh, some of that is again having the courage to talk about these very hard issues they're very hard to talk about especially in the political context today sure. you know it's very hard to do that sure yeah. all right well thank you so much for spending this hour with me i really really appreciate it it's been a great discussion I hope that it's been helpful. It's been a joy for me to work with you. And, um, you know, like I said, I care very much about vet med um, faculty, staff, and students and administrators across the country. I know that um, I'm impressed, I think, with the, the level of, of desire for people to learn and to do well, um, you know, by their, by the, um, the pet parents, as well as it working in large animal, um, you know, fields and, and agriculture and, and, you know, really interacting with every aspect of our society. And so, you know, I'm really thrilled and honored um, to be here. So. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us. So that brings our first episode of season three to a close. Be sure to look out for the next episode in early September. Um, we will have some great shows coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, in the meantime, you can listen and look at our back episodes on YouTube at the Diversity Matters at AAVMC channel or on SoundCloud, iTunes, uh, Stitcher, your favorite podcast app, please hit the like button. Um, and you can always find um, additional resources and information and programming ideas on the uh, Diversity and Inclusion On Air Facebook page on Facebook. So from uh, me to you, thank you so much for joining us and we will see you next time. Bye-bye, thank you.